Three years after a deadly crash, one family's fight for accountability drags on, but time and time again, their lawsuits against an Adams County deputy have failed. 22 people are in the running to be Denver's next mayor. We take a look at a new way of voting that could help cut down crowded fields of candidates. A nonprofit is offering dignity for those who don't have a place to call home. They die on the streets, they die under a bridge. If they're lucky they might get you know, be on a sofa somewhere. No matter the weather, one man's on a mission to camp out on some of Colorado's highest peaks. And 327 Fridays later, we always end the week on a sweet note. All of that is next. In the fight for accountability, there are limits under the law. Two teenage women who were killed when a sheriff's deputy arrested the driver of a car and told an 18-year-old to drive home without checking to see if she had a license. Now, she didn't know how to drive. Three and a half years later, the family has lost hope that there will be any charges or any justice. Here's Mark Salinger. The memorial out front serves as a reminder. It's been three and a half years. A reminder of how much has changed in the years since Twilight Hovey lost her daughter, yeah. Leah Ford. She was a senior in high school. The story takes us to a rural road in Adams County. Leah and her friend were driving with Leah's boyfriend on a summer night in 2019, home from an evening at Elich's. Her boyfriend was pulled over and arrested for a warrant for an unpaid speeding ticket. The Adams County Sheriff's deputy turned the car over to Leah. He told her to just go ahead and take the vehicle home. Problem is, Leah didn't have a license, didn't even know how to drive, her mom says. She shouldn't have been behind the wheel because she did not have her permit, nor did she have a valid driver's license. My daughter did not know how to drive. She had no driving experience. Yes, she was 18, but she was not ready to drive. She was seat belted in uh, drivers. The two teenage girls were killed when a truck slammed into their car around five miles away. And I didn't even think to check her. More than three years later, the fight for accountability has left Twilight feeling hopeless. There won't be any. Because I, I believe that they really honestly think that they did nothing wrong and no policy was broken. For him and Adams County to not be accountable for this, I think is an absolute miscarriage of justice. Jeremy Johnson represents Twilight. In the past years, they filed state and federal lawsuits against the deputy and the department. Both were dismissed. In federal court, they couldn't prove the deputy created the danger that ultimately killed the girls. In state court, lawyers couldn't prove he acted in a willful and wanton way. He was granted qualified immunity and her case was dismissed there. We're choosing not to name the deputy because he's never been charged. As far as we can tell, he never faced any punishment at the sheriff's office or with the state certification board for telling Leah to drive home without a license. He retired in 2021 and left the state. They should be held accountable like uh, the average citizen, like, like I am, like anybody. And there's, there's just no accountability there. After both the state and federal lawsuits filed on behalf of Twilight were dismissed, it was decided that they would not appeal those decisions. That could open Twilight up to having to pay the legal fees for Adams County and the deputy she was suing. Now, a spokesperson for the Adams County Sheriff's Office tells me today they do not believe any policies related to checking the licenses for passengers in the car have changed since that crash in 2019. But again, Mark, there's really no law here that was broken. Yeah, the sheriff's office back in 2019 actually told me that the officer was following protocol, that he had the discretion to allow someone to take the car home as opposed to having it towed. And at this point, it doesn't look like he broke any protocol. I can really hope that there was some sort of lesson learned here. Mark Salinger, thank you. Hey, have we mentioned that there are a lot of people running to be Denver's next mayor? 22 people to be exact enough to field a soccer match, and it's more than double the number of candidates who ran in 2019. So why are so many people interested this year? Could be due to a new campaign finance option helping low-profile candidates step up their fundraising. It's called the Fair Elections Fund, and this is the first election cycle that we will see it in action. The fund uses taxpayer money to fund a nine to one match for campaign contributions up to $50. So for example, every $5 someone in Denver gives the candidate, the city then gives them an additional 45. 
to get that fundraising boost, mayoral candidates first have to get 250 contributions. And so far, it's extremely popular with the mayoral candidates. 16 of the 22 have opted into this fund. But candidates with more deep pocket donors might want to opt out of the fund. Taking public money limits how much they can get overall from individuals and committees. With so many candidates, some Denverites are considering alternative voting methods. Tonight's next question comes from Steven Berger, who wonders if ranked choice voting might be a good idea in Denver. Great question, Stephen. Great name, too. Uh, ranked choice voting is typically intended to avoid a runoff, which is a likely outcome with so many candidates in Denver. In ranked choice elections, voters rank their candidates in order of preference. Election officials tally all of the first choice votes first. If no candidate clears the 50% margin, the candidate with the least amount of votes is then eliminated. Then anyone who ranked that candidate first on their ballot then has their second ranked option counted instead. That process continues until one candidate ends up with a majority. Critics argue it's too difficult to switch to a new system, but advocates say it's a way to include more diverse candidates. Candidates who would normally be discouraged from running um, are free to do so because it doesn't harm anybody that they run. So you don't have to worry about splitting away support so you can have new viewpoints get into the race. Only a few Colorado communities currently use ranked choice voting. It's too late for it to be used in Denver this election cycle. A switch to ranked choice voting would first have to be approved by the voters. A Colorado law guaranteeing abortion access across the state will face its first big test in Pueblo, where city councilors are considering an ordinance that would effectively ban that procedure within city limits. The ordinance was drafted amid controversy over an abortion clinic planning to open in Pueblo. If it's passed, the ordinance would allow private citizens to sue abortion providers. Abortion rights advocates say the bill is a violation of Colorado's recently passed Reproductive Health Equity Act. And Attorney General Phil Weiser says he would challenge any local decisions that violate the state's abortion protections. But Pueblo City Council is moving forward with a vote scheduled later this month. Many homeless people die where they live, under bridges, on streets, and alone. But one organization wants to change that. A nonprofit called Rocky Mountain Refuge offers dignity and care to those who would otherwise be alone in their final days. Colorado's homeless don't have many choices. Most shelters aren't equipped to provide the around-the-clock medical care. And Medicaid only covers five days in hospice. Rocky Mountain Refuge works with hospice agencies to provide medical care for those in need. And the nonprofit's volunteers provide another valuable service, companionship. Everyone that's come to us has, when, when they passed away, someone has been with them, either praying with them or just holding their hand or being with them and they're not alone. Rocky Mountain Refuge believes that they are the only, organ only the fourth organization in the country to offer this model of alternative hospice care. This week, we are counting on your word of thanks contributions to help provide holiday gifts for every child in Denver's public housing. Here's Kyle with an update. I love that your word of thanks micro giving campaigns passed $10 million raised with this one our annual effort to buy a holiday gift for every child in Denver's public housing. This is the third year that you all have made sure that when parents sign up for that gift list, when they're courageous enough to ask for help, that no child misses out because the nonprofit runs out of funds. Scan the QR code on your screen to join me in donating, or you can find that link on the next section of 9news.com or on any of Next social media accounts. The last two years, so many of you have been willing to chip in $5 for this particular effort that not only have you covered gifts for every kid in Denver's publicly owned housing, you've also expanded the gift giveaway to kids in Section 8 housing, too. That is the power and the reach of what you have created through Word of Thanks. Thank you. One way to beat the crowds on Colorado's highest peaks, go when no one else wants to. There's nothing out there but just you and nature. It's just the best thing in the world. And one couple wants to cash in on an invention that lets you get up close and personal with some tiny feathered friends. We look back on the project's beginnings here on Next. The ongoing Marshall Fire recovery efforts are getting a financial boost. FEMA just approved another $1.5 million for the cost of fighting that fire in Boulder County. 
fire sparked nearly a year ago on December 30th in the Louisville and Superior communities. It destroyed more than 1,000 homes, 200 commercial buildings, and it caused major infrastructure damage. So far, FEMA has provided more than $37 million in funding. It's been a very windy day across the Denver metro area, so windy that our resident meteorologist, Poet, was almost blown away. Corey Reppenhagen is on the weather beat. A force of nature, messenger of storm's power, mind rattling sound. That was Corey Reppenhagen on the weather beat. Yeah, he's making us all look bad with those haikus. Some gusts uh, topped out anywhere between 80 to 90 miles per hour as high temperatures for today topped out in the middle top or 50s. Right now, though, 32 degrees in the Denver metro region, 19 degrees in Kremlin. Current wind chills, though, in the upper teens and lower 20s in Denver. So this is really what you're going to have to dress for if you're headed out the door. HD Doppler radar showing all that snow moving out of our hair. Not a whole lot of snow, but a little bit out towards the mountains. And as we head through this evening into the early hours of tomorrow, morning. We're expecting a few more clouds and a little bit more snow for our friends in the mountains between the 2 and 3 o'clock hour before that dissipates come late tomorrow night and into early Sunday morning. When it's all said and done with this system, not a whole lot of snow anywhere between 1 to 2 inches in Steamboat Springs and just under an inch in Winter Park. High temperatures for tomorrow will top out in the middle to upper 40s, a little cooler as you're pushing into the upper elevations. Seven day forecast though, not looking too bad, especially for the Parade of Lights, which is tomorrow night. Overnight low temperatures tomorrow only sinking back down into the upper 20s and lower 30s back in the 50s on Sunday and Monday. All right, Greg, thank you. Climbing 14ers, backpacking, even winter camping, all pretty common ways people enjoy the outdoors in Colorado. But here's someone who combines them all into some epic days in the mountains. I absolutely love it. I love the cold weather. I love the snow. Everything about the, the mountains I just absolutely love. My name is Tyler Brooks. I take people out hiking in the Rockies and I photograph their adventure out for the day. Hopefully we'll see something to photograph today. I go out to the mountains to really get away and I couldn't get away in the summertime so I said you know what, I'm going to try this winter thing. I grew up in the mountains. I love the cold. One of the things I love to do is uh, camp on the summits, uh, camp on the 14er summits in the wintertime. Let's see, I've done Humboldt, Uncompagre, La Plata. My goal is to get in at least seven or eight this, this uh, wintertime. In the wintertime, you can't really go out and explore on the summit at the wintertime. So, um, you know, read a book, cook dinner, um, relax. Hope for the best and plan for the worst. In the wintertime, you have to bring so much more equipment. Just the weight in general. Sometimes my bag can be 60, 70 pounds. And you know, you get up to the top and you're just exhausted. It's really windy up there and you don't have any trees or any shrubbage to really break down the wind. If you don't have a four season tent, the wind will just whip through and really chill you to the bone. It's a really, truly ex um, unique experience, you know, just to, f to feel like you're completely alone. It's completely quiet. There's no cars. There's no loud music. There's nothing out there but just you and nature. It's just the best feeling in the world. Before they made it big time, a Colorado couple shared a one-of-a-kind invention with Next. We'll let them pitch it here one more time before they go national later tonight. And our favorite Friday tradition continues with some extra sweet good news to end the week. Some old friends of Next will be on TV again tonight, but this time it'll be big time. Joan and John Creed are going on the ABC, ABC show Shark Tank to pitch their design for a hummingbird viewing mask. They first pitched it to me and photojournalist Ann Herbst back in 2017. And since tonight's their big night, we decided to give their story an encore. One look at the landscape from the distance. You can see why Westcliff is a nice place to get away. Time to have fun. Mm -mm -mm. But the house on Pinecone Lane is more than a vacation spot. Yeah. Consider it <laughs> summer camp. Don't lose your balance. Summer camp. You need to tighten that up. For adults. 55 is the new, I don't know, 50, I don't know. Think about it. There's physical activity, games. You're doing great. Oh. Plus, you don't have to wait for the campfire. You're getting a little rad. To hear a few songs. With a spin, you see. Look out, Johnny. You're going to fall. I got you. How about that? 
Been my summer camp for the last 46 years. John Creed's been bringing his childhood buddies up here every summer. It's kind of a place where the rest of the world doesn't matter. And this year, he made the whole summer camp experience complete. Oh, yeah. With a very strange arts and crafts project. I just figured out a way to make something that would work, and here we are. Here they are. Oh, that one just touched my hair. The cabin in the woods has always been swarmed with hummingbirds. Well, hi, little hummer. There just never was a way to get a good look. Until now. Come on in. The nectar's fine. He's doing a selfie with the birds. That's cool. There's a little good interaction between the bees and the birds. I guess that's the birds and the bees, right? Yeah, <laughs> good one. Yeah, that was a pretty clever one, wasn't it? If I would have said it correctly the first time, it would have been clever. Where else can you get up close and personal to a hummingbird? It's amazing how much air they create with those little wings. Dear mom and dad, we're having a blast at summer camp. Three little birdies. The bird watching is amazing. Humming around my head, making me kind of nervous. The people are pretty great, too. Watch for the bee that's around your crotch, John. <laughs> Signed, Steve Steger. Birds and the bees and, and Ann Herbst. Birds and the trees. My best Corey Repenhagen impression from five years ago. Hoping that they get some cash to make the hum viewer a household name tonight on Shark Tank, starting at 7 on ABC. We don't usually encourage you to watch a different station, but it might be cool for that. Your good news and your feedback. Next. Colorado School of Mines held their structural competition today with 17 teams competing. Their gingerbread bridges were put to the test and put to our favorite question. My good news is just having so many young engineers and budding uh, student engineers here today. My good news is I'm just really excited to, you know, beat a bunch of college students. Good news uh, for my dad, he has a box of Funyuns in our garage. My aunt had a baby. My good news is that I've been connecting with more friends um, and I've been hanging out with more friends. So I'd say that's pretty good news for me. My good news is that I just got an offer for an internship in LA this summer, so I'm pretty excited about it. My good news is the World Cup is uniting all the different cultures around the world and giving us a show at the same time. My other good news is I have a lizard at home and he's like my favorite pet and soon he'll get a brand new cage just for him and it'll be a lot bigger and he'll be a lot healthier. What's his name? His name is Costco Chicken. My good news is that during the process of making the bridge that like I can communicate with like my peers more. Pretty pretty solid cracking at 348. Yay! Costco chicken's the best. Uh, from the text line tonight, why do the weather people have to talk so fast? The news people get to talk normally, so do the sports people. Just asking. They have a lot to fit in. I just did a two-minute story about hummingbirds. Maybe that's the difference. We'll see you next time.